Talkie song! The first alien cried, pointing his odd rifle at the pair of pilots. Cookie regarded it through the stinking cloud of cigar smoke. It repeated itself. To. Ki. Song. Milk cocked her head, blowing out a ring. One of the soldiers nudged the one who shouted, whispering something in an odd, lilting language. All consonants, no vowels. Su. And ah. She called again. The accent was wrong. Too much emphasis on the middle. Nothing on the first or last syllable. Milk held up a finger and took a deep drag from her cigar as Cookie snorted and stomped his out. The half-finished Cubans found their way to be crushed onto the dirt as the bears slowly raised their hands in surrender. Aside from the guards, Camp 773 was like any other camp Seer training had prepared us for. Some rumours going around had that this was a USPOW training camp before the SHIELD took it over and reforged it to their specifications. Barbed wire gates, Wash towers with guards, one massive tower in the center, a landing pad for supplies well outside the camp, and shitty bunks dotting the hard packed ground. The only difference really was the skin color and height of the guards, and the fact that they were all women. Some of the marines would laugh and cackle the women when they were marching by on duty, but nothing really came of it. Some of the off-duty soldiers would cackle back, and for the first week we all fell into a pattern. They stayed on their side of the fence, and we stayed on ours. The Nevernecks were sure these are alien marines, so that's what we ended up calling them. Nobody really corrected us. And then a week later, the spooks arrived. Well, technically it was the interior, but we just called them spooks. They were thorough, quickly moving through the camp and taking everything we carried in. When someone protested, they get a gun shoved in their face or beat them with a stump baton. People quickly shut up. They'd take survival blankets, pillows we'd smuggled or traded for, food stored under cots. They even took milk and cookies aviators. Not even the marines did that. And at the end, they pushed everyone out to the parade ground. A large woman stood there, wearing no armour, but standing with a confidence that comes from knowing that nothing could hurt you. She wore what our best guest pegged as a formal gown, probably a dress uniform of some kind. She spoke that weird, harsh language, that some of the marines who spoke German said sounded like that tongue. She spoke that language for a good ten minutes. We all wanted to look around in confusion, but the military discipline kept us in line. And then a smaller one stepped forward and began to speak. She, the noble Shanxi, matriarch of the House of Orlon, welcomes you to the true Shulfanti Empire prisoner of war camp. As a member of the interior, she has seen how lax safety and security was taken by the marines and decided to step in to correct these wrongs. I shall now announce the new restrictions and commands she has given you. As the smaller male Shulvanti talked, soldiers with strange uniform marks walked forward and began placing bundles of clothes at our feet. Each of the bundles looked like the kind you give to prison inmates. After a bit more talking about generic stuff, don't talk to guards, you are prisoners, not soldiers, escape and we will shoot you, that kind of stuff. He said the magic words that indicated how badly this next month will go. You will now turn in your ID tags and pick up your jumpsuits. You will then proceed to your bunks and put the suits on and remain there until mealtime. There was a pause. A soldier spoke formation and began to look down at the suits and look around. And then at a single man. Colonel Nurdi Mailkov was the highest ranking soldier in the camp, something identified very early on. The son of a Chechen refugee, he had put the pieces of what was about to happen together sooner than anyone else. He stepped forward and spoke up. Well, ma'am, he began. I don't know about your nation, but ours has requested that all POWs, prisoners of war, be treated with dignity. Part of that is letting us keep our ID. Before he could finish his sentence, a stun baton bashed into his gut, sending him to his knees. The smaller one whispered a translation to the larger woman. The woman laughed. I saw Milk and Cookie's hackles raise and the hair on the back of their neck stood on end. They later said it was the same laugh the pilot they shot down had. You are now a subject of the Empire and we are the Empress's interior, the smaller one translated. You will not question us and you will learn respect. Colonel Malikov slowly stood back up and glared at her. We will not 
be turning over R.I.D. tags, he said simply. And that is how the first riot of Camp 773 began. Private Cora Kinnock, U.S. Army, on the interior's takeover of Camp 773. Iveen Milk McDermott and Ryan Cookie Kennedy sat quietly in their bunk. The curfew was enforced, and after the riot, nobody in the camp had the energy to sneak past guards to visit other barracks. Milk rubbed the ring threaded onto a dog tag chain, while Cookie massaged his leg, trying to get it to stop twitching from where a guard held a shot button onto it. They were both sporting black eyes and bruises, just like everyone else in the camp. Colonel Milikov had been grabbed earlier on in the riot and dragged away, and nobody had seen him for a few days. Anyone plan uh, Steve McQueen? Cookie asked Milk, referencing the lead actor in The Great Escape. Milk shook her head. Still feeling the spooks out, she replied. Gotta find out what's ignored and what's punished first. Been a bit of a problem. Inconsistent? Inconsistent as shit, the WSO replied with a bite. I so much just blink and get smacked around. I was gonna steal food and get a glare. Think it's because we shot down that one gunship? Maybe. The pair drifted back into silence. Colonel Milikov was returned to us at the end of the week, beaten and blooded, dumped in front of his bunkhouse in the middle of the night, missing teeth, and with one eye nearly swollen shut. He was quiet. They're like the KGB, he said, unchecked and everywhere. He'd know. His father was brought in for questioning once by the KGB before his mother ran for NATO lines. He remembered her watching news reports of the Second Chechen War and crying. The perps intercepted whatever the Red Cross tried to send us. I know this because I saw a pair of them rooting through one of the care boxes and trying to figure out how to open a carton of Marlboro Reds. Ended up just slicing it open with a knife and trying one. Gotta say, first time seeing a perp smoke one of our shitty cowboy killers, I'll remember that until I die. Anyway, shit like that kept ramping up till a breaking point. Apparently, a couple of the guards got drunk on duty one night and decided they wanted to have some fun with one of the prisoners. His bomb mate came back from the shitter, seeing them ripping off his clothes after they gagged him. The intention was clear. Turns out those fancy visors of theirs weren't as good against a solid wood chair being brought down on the back of their stupid skulls. Then, the one who wasn't not the fuck out called for backup. The bomb mate shouted, Riot! and shit just went insane. Turns out marines don't like it when invading aliens try and rape one of their buddies. Who knew? Sergeant Major Colin Ryan, USMC, on the second riot of Camp 773. Neither interior member was charged with any crime. She's looking for whoever shot down a UFO. Someone whispered down the line at lunch. Milk and Cookie froze. Her daughter was on it and died. She's out for revenge. Well, shit. Cookie said. No kidding, Milk replied. When she finds out. Cookie shook his head. Don't say anything. If the Colonel says they're like the KGB, they're like the KGB. Can't know who's listening. Milk nods. Right, right. Well, this is a mess. Cookie snorts. Understatement. Gotta say, Milk began, changing the conversation. If it wasn't for them being the occupying force, I'd be all over these ladies, she said loudly. Anyone who could pull off an armored cast suit, mmm. Some of the other soldiers around the table laughed and raised their cups. Hear, hear. Cookie shook his head. You are such a useless lesbian, he said with a fond smile. And don't you know it, Kennedy? The first escape attempts happened soon after the second riot. Foes got it into their heads that there might be a resistance kicking around outside and that they were waiting. Said they noted some figures on the nearby hill with binoculars watching the camp. Thought they were enemies of the Shulvanti. Turns out they were enemies of the interior, and when they arrived, we were happy to see them. First, the interior guards cut our sleep and confined us to bunks. Nobody could leave except for parade hour when we were screamed away before sunrise and made to stand listening to whatever propaganda they had translated into English that day. Made some of us feel like we were back in basic. If we weren't getting yelled at or beaten for not doing whatever menial tasks they had us doing, we were stuck in the small barracks. Probably ten bunks and fifteen soldiers per bunkhouse. Cramped living, but we slept in shifts and kept up watches. Again, 
just like basic. Then they cut our rations. After the shield kicked us out, we found out that we had originally been served a single Shilvanti MRE per day. Enough to get a soldier for a rock, but not much else. Not even a combat MRE, which were made to be eaten as quickly as possible. Just a standard garrison meal. During those last few weeks, that was cut in quarters. First they took away lunch, so we ate at sunrise and sunset. Then seeing we weren't beaten to hell, they cut how much food we got. A good meal of two nutrient bars, a litre of water, and some assorted mass stuff became eight ounces, and a single bar with no mass stuff to rat it out. Starvation rations. That got us hurting. Some soldiers always seemed to have a few more bars to share around than others. We never questioned how they got them. The look in their eyes was telling enough. Kept that up for a few weeks, and we started to suffer. We got into fights with each other, which just had the guards waiting until someone was on the ground before going in and beating everyone involved senseless with their stun batons. Or opening fire with those rifles set to hurt into the gathered crowd. We were getting pissed, and we were getting reckless. Turns out not everyone had discarded their seer training, and we had a few engineers in the group. Since we were pretty much entirely confined to quarters, the combat engineers pushed aside some bunks and started digging. Soon enough we had a half-decent tunnel network between the bunks, and for a while, it was undiscovered. And then some folks tried to make a run for it. You see, you give US Army combat engineers nothing to do, and shovels, and they'll dig a trench. Leave them alone for a bit longer, and they'll dig a bunker system. Slap a fence in their way, they'll tunnel under it, and pop up at the nearest booze joint looking for a good time. The shield not only put a fence in their way, but they said they weren't allowed to cross it. It was inevitable that the tunnel out was finished as quickly as it was. Shame they misjudged how far out the Shilfanti guards were able to fire. Private Jack Mendoza, US Army, on the starting of the third riot of Camp 773. Milk and Cookie woke up to the sound of alarms, shouts and strange weapon fire. At first Milk thought the camp was being liberated, but when the weapon fire died down and no sharp crack of ballistic projectiles were applied, she had to admit it was probably a faint hope. Cookie looked over to the army engineer in the barracks, who was quickly covering the tunnel under his bed and brushing soil off his orange jumpsuit. He shook his head sadly. Barely after they threw the planks over the still disturbed hole, a boot kicked the flimsy door open and a Shilvanti interior guard started screaming at everyone to get out, rifle up and tracking the POWs. As the pair were marched out, they noticed a handful of soldiers dragging some human POWs back, kicking and screaming. Literally in one case, before Jujis' application of Stumbaton put an end to it. As the whole camp was marched out to the parade ground, three of their fellow POWs were brought up onto the stage with guards standing behind them. The guards forced them to kneel. Cookie barely heard Colonel Milikov take a short breath in through his teeth before the interior noble walked on stage and began to yell angrily. Some of the guards laughed along at what seemed like jokes before the translator did his job, and everyone's face paled at the exact same moment. It seems your fellows have decided the gracious accommodations of the interior were not to their liking and tried to flee without saying goodbye. That was rude of them. I think we need to teach them a lesson, don't you agree, girls? Milk and Cookie felt tunnel vision began to creep in as they said wide-eyed at the soldiers standing behind the kneeling POWs, all holding pistols. If they don't want to stay here, perhaps they feel more at ease at the goddess's side, or whoever you dirty primitives pray to. All Milk remembered was the silence. The silence, as the noble raised her hand in a dismissive gesture. The silence broke when, as one, the electrical hum of an energy pistol being ready for an overcharged shot echoed through the camp. The silence broke in even further when every soldier, every voice, every beaten down and pissed off prisoner of war rushed forward with nothing in their hands but spite and rage. Milk remembered tackling the legs out of a guard as a marine dived towards her face, tripping her to the ground. She remembered her face getting spited with blood as a third soldier brought his boot down onto the woman's skull, adrenaline forcing him to ignore the sickening crunch of bone and boot as purple mixed with red and the guard died. Grey matter spilled all over the sand. She remembered looking over to see Cookie diving onto the stage and slamming his soldier into the chest of one of the kneeling prisoners, pushing his head out of the way as the Shilvanti guard instinctively fired her weapon, swimming the arm of the poor bastard trying to attack her. 
The nobles scramble back in fear as a hundred and challenged angry voices are raised as one against her. Her guards firing blindly, not even thinking enough to set their weapons to lethal. POWs drop to the ground screaming in pain from the low powered laser blasts or silently from the guards with enough wit to raise the power on their weapons. But it was not enough. This was a riot. A pit fight. A knockdown drag out bar brawl. This wasn't the area for fancy tech and long guns. This was the place for survival instinct and rocks and adrenaline. And nobody fights harder than someone with nothing left to lose. Milk barely remembered what happened during the 20 minutes the camp was set ablaze in full on riot. All she knows is when a marine gunship overhead began to open fire with stunner rounds and blowing at everyone, POW and Interior, was to stand down. Her face was stained with blue blood and she was missing her pinky. Cookie fared better. His arm hung limply at his side, and he resorted to headbutting the interior guard who had him pinned, before she was shot off him by a Shulvanti Marine, who then put her gun in his face and told him to stand down. And just like that, it was over. The soldiers had arrived. An exosuit stood in the centre of the camp, with gunships flying in a low circle. Marines, wearing full helmets and heavier armour than the interior, had separated the groups. The POWs readied for another assault before humans pushed through the washing marines. They wore white coats, with an odd purple emblem stitched over their heart. But the university recognised Red Cross and their soldiers had every prisoner's soldier sign in relief as they rushed forward, shoving soldiers to the ground and forcing those fit to stand to clear the area with the tone of voice only trained corpsmen had. Relief had arrived, and just in time. Cookie collapsed onto Milk, eyes flickering as Milk was forced to the ground by one of the medics. The doctor put a strange injector to the side of her neck, and the last thing she saw before passing out was a Shulvanti woman in a strange brass chest piece and cape, marching up to a terrified looking noble with what looked like intent to kill. She passed out smiling. Debrief of the events in Prisoner of Conquest Camp 773. Writing Officer Mistress of Arms, Senior Marine, Salfi Kaltani. Reason for Debrief. Failure of the interior and overseeing noble, Shangxi of the House of Orlong, to hold her soldiers and camp to Shulvanti standards. Transcript of the brief to follow. 134 pages omitted. Filled with Chief Communication Officer Ashil. Document number 18537411B. Salutis Orange Clearance required to read. Result. Prisoner of Conquest Camp 773. Back under Marine Expeditionary Force Command. Shanxi of House Orlon removed from position as overseeing noble. No further punishments allotted. Document end.